Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's session on modern Android development. I'm Zainab, and I'll be presenting our two speakers today, who are GDG organizers here in Kuwait. Um, first off is Rajneesh, um, a lover of Android and Kotlin, and um, very enthusiastic uh, for today's talk. And we have Mario, uh, who is also um, a mobile software engineer that creates software solutions and facilitates people's lives and mobile payments uh, SDKs and provides simple, powerful ways for um, payments online, basically. So you have a little bit of um, leeway near the end of the talk that we can ask questions. Um, if it's urgent questions, I recommend that you write them in the chat. We'll try and answer them as soon as possible. And this session is being recorded. It will be added to uh, our YouTube channel as well. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to present uh, Mario. I think you're going first. Are we right? That's okay. Can you hear me good now? Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, welcome everybody to the session. Uh, we are happy to be with you today. Uh, as you may, might see in the description, we are going to talk about the uh, modern Android development. Can you share your screen, uh, Mario, I, before you go ahead? Sorry. Great. Um, Everything is clear now. Uh, I will be uh, with you today, me and Rajinish, uh, to introduce what actually Google uh, uh, give us as a tools to uh, improve the, the way that we uh, do the Android code, uh, modern Android technologies and everything like this. So when we uh, say modern Android development, uh, we mean the tools, APIs, language and distribution technologies, uh, which is recommended by Google team to us, the developer, to be productive and create better apps, okay? So this is the mainly four columns that we are going to cover today. Uh, language, which is basically about uh, how we can use Kotlin and make the most benefit from it. Also the tools, what Android Studio actually introduced to us. What is the new tools in the Android Studio? ABIs, which is have, we, we have many ABIs. Uh, Google keep introducing it one by one. And the distribution. Okay, so uh, let's start. We can now start by the uh, tools, which is the Android Studio. At the beginning of the session, we need to introduce the, the, any, how the growth of the Android Studio had become. Uh, Android Studio is released in 2013 and starts the evolution, evolution sorry, until we reached now in 2020. Uh, during this period, we have many uh, new technologies added to the Android Studio like the navigation editor, the view bindings, the Kotlin support, constraint, constraint layout editor, many things. But the latest thing now introduced in version 4.0 is the motion editor, which uh, may you have come with it or no. You can see uh, how it's now uh, very easy to make something like uh, motion, make something uh, go from uh, one, one part of the screen to the second part uh in this easy way without need to go to write uh, uh, a little uh, yani, uh, obstacles of code little hassle go with uh, many things that yani, it's overhead for all of us so to start with the motion layout we prefer to have our uh, custom demo to to uh, illustrate how we can do something like this uh, we will go with the basics of how we can uh, move something uh, from the beginning scene to the end scene, and we have okay, you know, how we can change the attributes of this uh, widget through the time. So let's start. Here is we have created a totally new Android project, as uh, we expect all of us uh, know. Here is uh, our view, our layout is using constraint uh, layout, the normal one, and it's have a text view. This is the base uh, layout we got after creating a new project. 
first thing we need to check, we need to make double check that uh, the constrainly out version in our project is matching to, because this is where the motionly out is introduced. After making sure that the constrainly out version is two, we can go through the uh, implementation of the motion layout. Here, we will don't go through the code. We don't need this build view. We will just go everything from here, the designer. First of all, we have here a constraint layout, uh, and we need to change it to motion layout. So uh, Android introduced a sample function. Here, you can click on compare to motion layout, just confirm and everything is done for you now. As you see, uh, here is the motion editor has been opened with a start scene and end scene and is ready to be used. So uh, what actually happened behind the scene to give us this? Let's have a look. Here is inside the code, we have uh, a layout description, attribute added with file called activity main scene. This file, as have been added under the XML uh, directory. And for now, the file is something like empty, it's just defining that we have a start constraint and end constraint, but nothing more. There is nothing written here to indicate what will be done. And we can manage everything from the designer, no need to go back to the, the code again or edit any XML stuff. So to start, as you see here, there is a component text view Maybe we don't need a stick view. Let's replace it with uh, some button. Now the button is placed in our view and we need to go uh, with the start scene. Where exactly we need the button to be uh, inside our view in the start scene, uh, we need to adjust the constraint. We will select the button. So here, if you can see, I need the button to be center in the top. So let's add in this constraint one by one. Here is, we align it to the top with padding eight, margin, sorry. And we are making uh, alignment to the center by adding left and right constraint. Now let's go to the end. We need the, the button to move from the start of the screen to the end. So we will add the same constraint, but in the reverse way to the bottom of the screen. Same here. Now, as you can see, if we click on the start, the button here is in above the screen. If we click on the end, the bottom is go down. And if we click on this arrow in the bottom of the start to end screen, here is the transition and how it will be like. Let's play the transition and see. I think it's clear now. The button is going from the top of the, uh, the view to the, bottom, yani to the end of the view. And that's what we need for the first uh, step. Now let's add some customization to the button itself. Maybe we need it to be uh, during, during the moving, we need the, the color of the button to be changed. So this will be a custom attribute. So let's set some custom attribute to the beginning and another custom attribute to the end of the uh, motion. So at the start, we are selecting the button. We are adding some custom attribute. What is the attribute type that actually we need? It will be color. We are going to change the background color. So you write background color here. And the value, let's start with the primary value as example. Now simply in, the, in a clear way, the, the button at the start has already applied the, the primary color. And at the end, we need to add the same steps here. So we will adjust the color, the background color. And maybe we will use the color accent here. So I think it's now uh, more clear. Let's just play our transition and see how it will be look. As you can see now, the button is moving from purple to the slight green from starting to the end without even need to write a single line of code. But actually, as we agreed in the beginning of the session, everything we add in, in the motion layout, it's actually added here. So the start and the end was 
empty. Now we have the constraint for the bottom, which is eight and aligning to the start and the end. Same here. And inside the, the bottom, we have custom attribute added with the background color we need. So starting with the primary, ending with the color accent. That's a, the simple uh, beginning of the, uh, how, how we can motion some, some widget from the you know, over the screen. Now let's add some uh, other custom attributes to the transition itself. Maybe if we come here, we have something called key position, key attribute, key trigger, key cycle. We have many things that we can play with. So let's start with the position. We assume that we need here to uh, add the position a quarter, first quarter of the screen when it's aligned to parent. We need to align it to the right. So I will write the, the X value and the Y value and let's add it. So now you can see the change, what actually happened to the uh, motion boss. Let's make the same, add another key position, but this time we will add it to the, uh, almost the, the last quarter, and we will change the values again. Now, uh, as it look, here if we try to play our motion, so the button is going to the, from the bottom, uh, from the top to the bottom, going first to left and coming to right and uh, settle at the end. This is how we can uh, draw a motion bus, how we can change the position of item through the, yani, through the motion. Let's make another thing, uh, which is, uh, let's play with the key attribute. Maybe the attribute now that we need to uh, change the rotation of the button at the uh, half of the bus, which is 50. Let's add this and see again how it will look like. Now it's rotating and come back. I'm sure if you need to change the, the value of the rotation at any time, here is the, the value. Maybe we need to make it 360. So it's rotating a full round of rotation in each half of the screen. Until now, I think uh, everything is good. Uh, let's uh, play this and see how it will look like on the emulator. When it run, we, we don't expect uh, that we find any motion actually happening because of what? Because if we haven't defined when the motion should be triggered, what exactly is the action that the motion should go, uh, should start. So uh, now, as you can see, the button is loaded now, but actually it's not moving, uh, it's freezing. We cannot, any when we click on the button, nothing happens. So what we need to add now is uh, to start the motion on click on this button. So let's define this in the transition here. In the on click, as you see here is a click and swipe actions. We will go with the click. We need the click action to be toggle. So we will choose toggle from the menu. Also, we need to toggle, toggle this uh, target ID will be the button. So we'll choose the button from the menu. Now everything should be set it. So let's try again and run our application. Here is our button. Let's have a nice click. The motion is going correctly and so fast. If we need to make it a little bit slower, we can adjust the duration here. So let's make it 5,000 and try again to be clear 
we need to uh, see what's happening. Now, we can see every details that happening to the bottom. The motion with the duration is now clear. As we agreed from the beginning, every single line we have uh, making from the editor is added here. Everything like in the big key position, key attribute, uh, the duration itself, if we change it to 5,000, everything is reflected in the XML file. But actually, you don't need to care about these things. You have everything here in the editor. You can see it. You can simulate the motion, how it will be in the simulator. And it's actually now matching the same what we see in the Android Studio and what is actually uh, done in the uh, emulator. So now we have uh, done with our first part, first tutorial of what is new in the Android Studio with the motion editor. And we now have know the, the basics of how to uh, uh, move uh, widget from the, uh, over the screen. And we know how to play with the position with custom attribute, uh, something like change the background color, uh, something like change the rotation. And there is many functions that you can explore in the motion editor. So we recommend uh, uh, you to start exploring it because uh, now it's uh, uh, getting rid of all the overhead we, we, we always had to uh, deal with when we need to deal with something like motion. Second thing uh, is the language. The modern Android development language is Scotland, as we all know. But here is the, the question came, why we need to use Kotlin? What actually Kotlin uh, advantage have over Java? So first thing, and uh, we must all agree on this, is that Kotlin is expressive and concise. Kotlin actually uh, let you uh, focus and express your idea and write less boilerplate code, which make headache to, to uh, write many lines of code to make single function. Now Kotlin make almost, uh, the, the, any, most of the job to you and left you just uh, small lines to, to uh, achieve your point. This is an example of the Java person class, which is a normal class, a data class which holds the ID and name of the person. And we have here a getter and setter methods for the ID. Also, we have a getter and setter methods for the name. And as you know, there is some uh, methods you need to override from the parent object uh, to use it, something like the two string. You need to be the object printed to print the, the object details, not the reference to the memory, as uh, it will happen if you call two string without overriding it. You need to override the equal. If you, make, if you will make comparison if this object is equal to another person or not, and you need to override the hash code. Same for checks for the equality. Uh, Kotlin actually says that uh, this is a boilerplate code. Every time you need to define get set uh, equals hash code to string for nothing. But actually you need just to deal with this idea and name. So what Kotlin came with? Now Kotlin was came something like data class. All you need to make is to write this data keyword in front of the, the class that will generate the uh, equals uh, the hash the two string methods for you, it will override and write all the uh, required logic. And uh, here is the, the default for, for now for any Kotlin class. It just adds uh, what you know, values you need, something like name, shared name, ID, and getter setter is auto-generated for everything. So this is the main advantage of Kotlin, which is concise. You don't need to write boiler blade code like this to just have something like class with two or three attributes. The second thing, which is safer code. As we know, Java, you need to mark uh, fields with annotation to nullable or not null uh, to indicate is this value can uh, have null or not. And it's just, uh, uh, just warning. It's, it's not forcing you to, to use the, the variable in this case or, or uh, in another case. But here with Kotlin, as we know, it's introduced the nullability in the type system itself. So uh, if, if, any, if the, the value is not accepting null values, you cannot set the value to null. It's, it's prohibited. Uh, also, if, any, if it can may hold uh, 
null value, you need to indicate it with this question mark. So the compiler will let you uh, secure your code before using it. He will, he will tell you uh, you need to use the saved instance state. So uh, you must check first if it's null or not. And this happened at uh, right time, compile time, not, not at the, uh, when you launch the, the application. But it's not only about the nullability or null safety. There is also uh, have widely used the, the lambdas now. It's, uh, you can use it in Kotlin everywhere with uh, a very, uh, very good experience and uh, tools. Also the extension functions. Now any, any class, you, need to, uh, you, you can add uh, extension function to it. You don't need to uh, override the, the class to add your function. Just something like the string now, you can make function called capitalize and it will do the job. You can write the logic inside it. Uh, no need for uh, keep uh, extending all the classes to add uh, custom functions to it. Also, we have that template expression. Kotlin support that you can write inside your string. Uh, as we see here, reference for uh, an instance and inside this instance you can deal with a function of the instance. This is what we call template. So Kotlin now supporting template expressions. Also the property access syntax for get and setter as we talked. Now it's just not about uh, fab dot get or uh, dot set, just fab dot and access the property direct and the getter and setter is already managed by, by the Kotlin. That was uh, about the syntax of Kotlin. But what actually uh, Kotlin introduced as a, we call ABI was as a framework to, uh, to be an addition to help you. Here is an instructed concurrence. How Kotlin help you to manage your uh, asynchronous process. Actually something like uh, making network calls or get something from the database which need to, ban to be managed on another thread. Uh, the Kotlin timeline introduced in, in first version in 2016, and now in 2020, we have the coroutines preferred. So uh, if we come with choosing a reactive programming framework for the modern and development technology, so we have a choice of two. You have choice of using RxJava, as it's the, again, the most known framework of handling the, the asynchronous process, or to have the newly introduced Kotlin coroutines. Uh, so here in, in our uh, demo, we need to introduce what is uh, every component in RxJava, what is the equivalent right, in the coroutines. So you don't need to, to rely on uh, third parts again. You just can go with the uh, native component now. So as you, need, uh, as you know, there is a hot observer and cold observer. For uh, those who, who don't need, uh, know, know the difference, sorry, uh, could observe for something like uh, that Netflix will uh, release a film. It's now uh, in, uh, exists on a server. When, uh, whenever you need to watch this film, you will use the app and go to the film. You will pull it and watch it. That's the way. So uh, it's, in, it, it will be released and it's available to you when you subscribe to this film to, be, uh, to watch it. The hot observer is, is not like this. It's like a theater. And uh, the show will start something like 4 p.m. If you come four and a half, already the show has started and it will not be uh, repeated again for you and you can't get it from the beginning. This is the difference between the hot observer and cold observer. So in the hot observer, Alex Java used to use subjects and here in Coroutine it introduced channels and we will see a snippet of the code how you can uh, use channels uh, as you already have known how to use subjects. Same for observables, uh, for the cold. Uh, if you deal with something like flowable, uh, single, uh, observable, maybe just any type of observable, the coroutine have introduced the flow and we also will, will come with for it. Threading is managed in RxJava with the schedulers. Now in coroutines is managed with the dispatchers. Also sub subscription holder which means you can keep a reference of subscription to clear it at any time or to cancel it. Uh, in RxJava, it's done by the disposable. In Coroutines, it's done by something called job. But the, the latest thing, which is actually make a big difference here, 
the memory management. In RxJava, you need to dispose or clear the subscription by yourself. That's why uh, in, in your view model, you need to uh, override the own clear and remove every subscription that already done. But in coroutines, the coroutine scope is managing everything automatically. So it also reduces boilerplate code. So let's go with it. Here is first beginning with the hot observer. Uh, here in Java, yeah, RxJava, you, we use to uh, use something of the subject, like published subject or behavior subject. And uh, when we need to emit a value or send it, we use on next and pass our value. And then we subscribe to our value and get the value received here. So no change in how uh, way is implemented. Kotlin introduced the channel. Inside the channel, you can send the value. And here, uh, when you need to uh, get the value back, you can call channel.receive and you will get your value back. No issues. Same for called observable. Here we are using the observable type or flower or anything. Uh, we have an end. And we define that we subscribe on the IO thread from the schedulers. Same here in the Kotlin flow. We have the flow and we are emitting one. And we are subscribing on the IO thread also through the dispatchers. So the threading is managing here by scheduler and managing here by dispatcher. And in another file, when you need to sub -yani, get the value back, here you are subscribing and get the value. Also here you are collecting the value and get it. So same lines of code, almost not a big change until now in, in implementing everything. But if we need actually to test the big change, let's come with a, a real life example. Here we are going through a something like uh, ABI that getting a menu. So we will go uh, with our uh, ABI interface and the repository and also the view model. So here for the first step, we don't have a big change. Uh, we will start from the bottom. In the RxJava, we have a menu ABI, which give us the ABI in something like flowable, observable. Here to get the, the API, just define the type directly and mark the function as suspend. Suspend function is the way Kotlin uh, coroutines deal with the asynchronous process. Inside the repository, also not a big deal. Here, instead of uh, the function is returning flowable, it will return the data directory, data direct with suspend function. And here we are observing on the uh, main thread and subscribe on the IO thread. For now, we are subscribing on IO thread to consume the ABI. And in the view model, we will handle the ministry. So until now, there is no big difference, as we see. But coming to the view model, here is came the, the power of the tool. Why, why we have uh, many lines of code here, but actually in the using proteins, there is almost just uh, some three or four lines. The, the main point come here, as we, we, we said, in the managing the subscription uh, reference. Uh, as we know, in the Rx Java, you need to have something like this composite disposable. We have uh, initiating something called dispose, dispose back to hold the subscription. And in when the, uh, we will need to override the unclear method to dispose uh, our subscription when the view model is destroyed. And uh, on the other hand, here is uh, on the load menu, we need to after subscription after calling the ABI, we will get a reference for the disposable and add it to the disposable bag to uh, dispose it when it's required. Now, in, in the view model, uh, there is almost, we don't need to use anything of this. So there is a, a headache uh, removed out of all of us. Another thing that uh, using the uh, live data extension or using Kotlin extension, making things also more easy. As we show here, we have defined load menu function to make the, uh, getting the menu from the repository process. And when we get it as a list, we are setting it to the value of the live data. But here, using the live data extension for the uh, suspend function, you can directly say live data dot emit the menu repository to get me. You are emitting the data 
without need to uh, have a, another function to get the value and buzz, you know, set the value to this like that. And here is also come a powerful tool in Scotland, which is the extensions. So we need to uh, talk about, uh, you know, talk a little about Kotlin extension. What's actually Kotlin extension? It's improved platform EBIs outside the platform releases itself. That means we have already have live data, but there is an extension for the live data you can use. Uh, here we will come with a quick example that uh, introduced to us the idea of, you know, behind the using extension. What you need to make is that we have a drawable image and we need to convert it to the bitmap image. So from the bitmap API, we need to use the create bitmap. From the drawable API, we need to using draw canvas because we will draw this uh, image in canvas in, inside the bitmap. And here is the code will be written inside the application to handle it. We need to adjust the boundaries, uh, set, uh, set the width height we need. After that, we are creating the bitmap reference. We are drawing the, the drawable image uh, using the canvas inside the, the bitmap and adjust the boundaries for it. Now with the Kotlin extension, the drawable have an extension called to bitmap, which is actually when you need to use it, do this. D, which is represented by the drawable, dot to bitmap, above the width and height, and you are done. So instead of having this, it's a single line. Actually, all, all this logic is done behind the scene. But for you, you don't need to write a boilerplate code to have the things done. Actually, uh, two bitmap is, is more than enough for you. And uh, everything like this is done in extension function and it's already ready to use. That is why the extension function came on the, uh, in, uh, in, on the scene. Uh, here is, now we are talking about the language, which Android Studio, we are, uh, sorry, the language with Scotland. We are talking about the tools for the new Android Studio, like the motion editor. Uh, this is the last section for me. I will go through the camera X with you. Here is, uh, if you are using uh, camera in the previous version, you have a, cho a choice to use the camera ABI 1 or camera ABI 2, but both of them has a mini boilerplate code to make things done. Now in, in the Jetpack Compose, sorry, in, in the new Jetpack library, uh, Google introduced the camera X, which actually Google uh, realized the pain of, uh, of writing many codes to just uh, make some analysis on the camera or make a preview or capture an image. So uh, it solves all this issue in the newly product, which is Camera X. Camera X is supporting ABI 21, which is mean working for over the 94% of the devices. Consistent on all the devices, it, it can run on, on any brand and it's easier to use. Uh, Google actually realizes that uh, you don't need to write the configuration first to make something uh, like capture image. Just at the beginning, define what you need to make, which is the use case you will use the camera in. And after that, uh, just try it, uh, a little bit configuration that's actually suitable for use case. So in, in Camera X, uh, Google introduced three new uh, use cases, or just inter until now it's introduced this use case. The first use case is a preview that you will open a, a preview window inside your application to actually uh, see what is uh, camera detecting at this time. Second uh, use case is the image analysis. You can use a stream that coming from the, from the camera to analyze uh, the data for any something like AI uh, machine learning purpose. And the latest thing that the use case for the camera capture, if you need to, to capture some image. So uh, how actually this is done in the code? First, uh, define the use case what you need to use. Something like here you are building the image capture use case and set something like target resolution and build. This is the first step, the configuration. Second step is binding your use case to the uh, camera provider. And also it's binding to the life cycle which we all know that it means uh, it will manage the uh, going through life cycle methods without any conflict in anything. And the last thing, do your action. Capture the image when you, you see that 
it's now time suitable to capture your image. Uh, how these things work? We have prepared a simple and nice demo for you. And let's see it together. It will uh, come through. We have like three use cases. We need to uh, preview the camera. After this, we need to uh, detect, uh, make analysis on the frames. If someone is smiling, then capture the image right now. So we have a demo is using the three use cases. Uh, to show you how it's simple to use Camera X now. So uh, I hope now you are seeing my screen well. Here is an, inside our uh, design, we just have the preview view, which is introduced in the Camera X, matching the parent of the layout and nothing else for them. Inside the main activity, as we have seen in, in the code, we need to uh, init the, the reference of the camera provider, which will uh, we will bind it later with the use case. After this, we will configure the use cases, something like we will we will configure the preview case, image capture, and image analysis. Done. We will use the orientation change listener because uh, I need to rotate my mobile now, so uh, I will keep it updated of the rotation. Now we, we come to the almost the, the, the uh, latest step, which is we will bind the use cases to the camera. We will uh, tell, tell the camera what to make uh, when reaching every new use case. And here, as you see, bind to life cycle, we are attaching our three use cases. And the point here is that uh, when we configure the image analysis, it's giving us the media image we are sending it to uh, a function called detect face smile. And also using Google machine learning kit, we can see how it's so simple. It's not about uh, a lot of code. It's just a simple code to, to analyze this image and know if something, if someone is smiling. So uh, display that sm smiling, uh, display that uh, image is captured and close the camera. So going through the code, it isn't the larger stuff. You can uh, figure the, the point from here, and you can uh, uh, read the documentation, how it's implemented in an easy way. And now let's start our demo and see how actually Camera X make everything uh, easy and some small steps. Here is the, the camera open. I'm supposed to smile. because the, the light isn't so good. It's not detected by smile. Now, as we see, it's captured here, and the image is already displayed. But it, it's take a, a little bit something like uh, three or four seconds because uh, uh, the light is not good at my area. But now, uh, with a simple lines of code, we have explored the use cases of the camera X, how we go through the preview, the analysis and capture when the action actually required. Now I came to the end of my uh, session. We have talked about the language using Kotlin, what it's more advanced or Java tools like Android Studio, Motion Layout. In the APIs, I just uh, talked about Camera X. And now uh, my friend Rajinesh will continue talking about the APIs and uh, the distribution, uh, these things. So thanks to you. And if someone have any uh, question, you can uh, share it now for my board. And uh, if not, Rajinish can continue with you. Thank you, Mario. So in my talk, I'll talk about some of the APIs uh, which are unbundled in Android Jetpack. So starting with the life cycle, if you see this diagram, it's really complicated to understand. And it's actually more complicated when you use fragment inside uh, activity. So you need to implement all this life cycle uh, on pause, on destroy, on start, on resume, and on stop to handle the state of the activity. 
and restore it when when you are uh, coming from stop state to resume state but using the life cycle we don't need this anymore let's see how how this has changed uh, this behavior so instead of activity or fragment we have now life cycle owners these are the life cycle owners now activity fragments are life cycle owner and you have to attach the observer to this uh, life cycle owner so that anything you want to listen for like for uh, start state you want to listen and you want to perform some activity you can do in that observer so the observer can implement any of the event life cycle event like if you see here uh, we have on life cycle event started so on start you are performing some activity and you can also look for the state as well what is the current state and uh, you might target like at least the activity should start and then i want to perform uh, certain tasks uh, on this activity so uh, i'll tell some of the uh, best practices for life cycle aware component keep your ui controller activity then fragment as lean as possible they should not try to acquire their own data uh, what i mean here is uh, the activity is not responsible for fetching the data from the network or local database it should know that this data ha has uh, i have this data and i want to uh, render it on the ui so you should not uh, make activity uh, know that you need to fetch the data from network or any local database we have view model for this to do that uh, and we can have a live data and observe the, observe that live data if any data is changes we get notified in the activity second is right data driven ui where your ui controller responsibility is to update the view views as the data changes and this is notified by the live data which are uh, of which are inside the view model and this get restored when the activity state has been destroyed third thing put your data logic in your view model class view model class should serve as the connector between your ui controller and the rest of your app be careful because the view model is not responsible for fetching the data you should have some repository layer which will be talking to your local database and the network uh, responses and uh, when you get a successful response if you are caching the data repository should know like in which database you want to uh, commit that data fourth thing is as uh, mario talk about the data binding in initial uh, slides so use data binding to maintain your code clean uh, with the clean uh, clean design so that activity should have less code and everything your logic should go to the uh, xml part i'll show some of the uh, data binding that i have used in my code fifth thing is avoid referencing a view or activity in the view model because view model has the separate life cycle and activity component has the separate life cycle if you are referencing your activity in the view model this can lead to a, a null pointer exception or it can leak the memory as well and if memory is leaking this won't be collected by the garbage collector and sixth thing is use kotlin coroutines for make performing a long running task and other operations uh, in your code so uh, some of the use cases of life cycle aware components are we let's talk about the video buffering so stopping and starting video buffering uh, we can use life cycle aware component to start a buffering as soon as possible but defer playback until app is fully started you can also use life cycle aware component to terminate buffering when your app is stopped so uh, the life cycle aware component only works between the started and the stop state of any component any component uh, the, the components like activity or a service or uh, content provider second thing is network connecti connectivity we can listen for the network state changes uh, and uh, update the the live data based on the state you are receiving 
third uh, is you can function based on the this life cycle of their component uh, if your activity is on pause state you should pause the animation and if its activity is in resume state again you can uh, resume the animations so this helps you in keep tracking of the activity states by using the life cycle aware component next thing is the location updates many apps has uh, are using google maps uh, to also location permissions to get the location of the user so you can switch between the coarse and fine grained location update we can use life cycle aware component to enable a fine grained location only uh, while your location app is visible and switch to coarse grain update uh, when the app is in the background here uh, we have a view model and view model stores the uh, state of the uh, uh, live data which helps you separate the data from the ui so let's talk about the uh, what is live data and what uh, extra functionality does uh, does this provides and i'll talk about some of the transformations that you can make uh, with uh, by combining the live data so live data is just a simple life cycle aware observable data holder class so uh, as i talk about the life cycle aware component uh, this means in order to observe changes you need to provide the life cycle this life cycle could be a view life cycle owner in case of fragment and the uh, activity life cycle owner in case of activity so what happens when the life cycle component is not in a appropriate state uh, let's say like your activity is stop or and or your activity is in a pause state so i'll i'll give you an example here uh, let's say your activity is in foreground and you are performing some operation and the value is updated of live data as the activity is in foreground you will get notified of the data changes but what about the case when the activity is in, is in background and it is in on stop state so if you perform some operation live data will be no, uh, updated with the new data but it the data won't be notified to the observer like if you are observing that life cycle in the activity that won't be getting notified because that is not in a appropriate state let's say again the data is emitted and again the activity is in background again the data will be not notified to the activity and when you resume back your activity will be getting notified only the last data that is emitted so live data holds the single value which is the latest value that was updated so this works perfectly well with ui because this is what you need to display on the ui latest data uh, that you have got uh, from the live data you want it to be displayed on your ui so moving ahead uh, let me show you some of the transformation that i have used in my code so if you see here i have used transformation dot map and this map uh, is taking the live data uh, which is the flow and converting uh, which is a flow and i am converting it to as as live data and now i am modifying it to uh, ui model which will be rendered on the ui so what it takes is map takes the one live data and transform it Uh, to the another live data which we want to look for like if suppose you have a response model uh, coming from the network and you want it to convert it into the ui model which will be actually shown on this uh, ui so you can use you can use and uh, use use this transformation dot map to transform the uh, from one live data to another live data coming back to the slides
So uh, here, you, uh, live data can be observed from any of this activity fragment. It can be any view, custom view, and you can change your UI as per the uh, data what you have received in the activity component. So now I'll talk about the room, uh, which will we will use, uh, which will return a live data from the database, which helps you uh, in notifying your data whenever the data is changed uh, from the data in the database. So what is the advantage of uh, this room uh, from the SQLite database? The first thing is uh, you. Uh, has you have the ability to uh, get the compile time error so that uh, you uh, if you are uh, using a normal sqlite as uh, uh, as we used to uh, use in our code previously so you you are not aware of the what query you are writing right so whenever uh, if if you want to check whether you have written a right query you you run the app and you uh, you can see a crash and uh, when the cursor is not uh, giving the getting the appropriate data so with room you get a compile time safety second most thing with room is you get the ability to observe the data changes so suppose uh, you have one uh, to do app and uh, you are inserting a new task in the app so as soon as the task is insert, inserted you can listen for all the tasks that are uh, uh, that are returning the live data like if you see here in this uh, slide get all is returning the live data so whenever any data is inserted so this will return a updated all the list of data from the database so how to implement this room uh, let's go back to the code so for uh, first thing is to add a, a dependency which is appropriate dependency for room so i have added three dependency uh, first one is the runtime and the compiler and the kotlin extension support for the room so after that we have something called as entity entity are nothing but the database tables which uh, uh, here i have a two three uh, tables like movie detail entity popular movie entity so uh, i have one separate file for all the constants i have defined uh, what will be the table name what will the uh, uh, what will be the column uh, name of the columns in the data table so so it helps you uh, in organizing your uh, tables very easily using some of the annotations and it should have one of the primary key in every table this is mandatory and you can also uh, use auto generated uh, value false or true whether the primary key is automatically be generated by the uh, uh, table or you want to explicitly provide the primary key this is how you define your table in the room next most important thing come is the dao data access object so this is just an interface where you query all your database uh, write your database queries and return those data like i have said uh, i am i will listen for all the uh, movies which are getting inserted into database and this will return me a live data so uh, any time any movies is in, inserted into a popular movie table you will get notified of that movie and you can you will be observing this data in your activity component next we, uh, next we have some uh, annotation uh, by default provided in the room which are insert you can also use uh, something called as uh, delete annotation uh, delete annotation to delete the table or delete the uh, row uh, row or column uh, in the table for inserting uh, we can simply put at the rate insert annotation and you can uh, provide some uh, conflict strategy. Uh, in this case, I am ignoring if the already uh, 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 primary ID, uh, primary key ID is there. So I'll just want to ignore that entry and uh, proceed to next. 
after you define your dao which will uh, which will where you will be writing all your queries for database next you will be writing a database which which you will be extending the room database class and this will be going to be a extra abstract class and this is the important section here in the database uh, annotation you provide the all the entities uh, related to that database and this will be knowing that this all are the table name inside this database and this version is as so, as you keep changing your database schema you need to upgrade this database uh, otherwise you your app will crash uh, when you try to run uh, after changing the your table schema or some uh, database schema and to use uh, i have created one util uh, util object and uh, using the room dot database builder class providing it the application context uh, and database class name and the database name and this uh, database class has one abstract method which is a movie dao so this will give me the do and i can access all the methods by uh, for query querying the database so that's all uh, for room uh, and how i have used uh, here is uh, in the view model i am just uh, i have added one layer repository repository which will be fetching data from network and putting it in into the database so uh, this is the committed code uh, so here if you see i have added repository dot get popular movies so this will call the repository and this will use the movie dao to get the all the popular movies if the movies are not there in the database i'll i'll go with I'll go with the network and get the data, uh, movies from the uh, network api and add it into the database all the entries so uh, let me show you quickly the uh, generated code for this uh, when you are uh, uh, defining your database and room with uh, annotation so if you go here so uh, if you see this all query has been written uh, for you by by itself you don't need to write everything uh from scratch uh, room has taken care of everything what is need to be defined you just uh, give the abstract of your database implementation and everything is done under the hood for you pretty easy to use the room for your uh, app application coming back to the slides so i have shown you in the code uh, how to add the room uh, with your application so uh, we have now live data plus view model plus room so that and, uh, and the data layer talks to the room uh, and fetch the data from the network or fetch the data from the database it's all logic has been written in the repository not on the view model as i informed as i told like uh we model should not worry about how to uh, add the uh, fetch the data from network or the repository next we have very important thing is uh, paging library so uh, paging library uh, is added because of the uh, if you are taking some of the chunks of data from the network or the database so you need to keep track of the appropriate pages and you you also need to make sure that uh, multiple network uh, network requests are not going at the same time and you need to write a lot of uh, logic for, for uh, to load the data in pages so uh, we 
come up with a paging library this keeps tax of the keys to be retrieved uh, the next and previous page uh, it automatically request correct page when the user has scrolled to the end of the list uh, ensuring that multiple requests are not triggered at the same time all also allows us to cache the data if you are using kotlin this is done in a coroutine scope and if you are using the uh, data this can be done in a live data scope so uh, it allows you to execute common operation like map or filter on the list that will be displayed on the screen so uh, some of the benefits of using paging library includes uh, in memory caching for the page data so so uh, this ensures that your app uses system resources efficiently uh, while working with the page data uh, built in request deduplication ensuring that your app's network bandwidth and this uh, and the system resources are used efficiently uh, we have configurable recycler view adapter that automatically request data as the user scrolled towards the end of the list and the first class support for kotlin coroutine and flow as well as for live data and rx java it also has the built in support for error handling including the re refresh and re uh, retry capabilities for this you need to define an adapter uh, separate adapter to handle the refresh and uh, uh, load uh, retry capability so uh, how to implement this paging library so uh, the paging library is divided into the three layers the first one is the repository layers the primary paging library component in the repository layer is the paging source and each paging source object defines a source of data and how to retrieve data from the source here source can be your uh, database or it the source can be your uh, network from where to fetch your chunks of data and paging source object can load data from any single source including the network source and the uh, local database another paging library component that you might use here is the remote mediator uh, this remote mediator object handles paging from a layer data source such as network data source with a database cache so it helps you helps you in fetching the data from the network response and then putting it in or caching it into the local database uh, if you want this functionality you should go with remote mediator uh, the app that i have uh, designed demo app uh, i'll use paging source uh, to fetch the data from the network next layer is the view model layer uh, here the pager component provides the public api for constructing the instances of paging data that are exposed in reactive stream based on a paging source object and a paging con uh, config configuration that you provide i'll uh, will see the code how to do this do this the third layer is the ui layer the paging library component in the ui layer is paging data adapter so you need to use uh, paging data adapter instead of a normal recycler view dot adapter or the list adapter which we normally use so uh, to display the data of paging we need to use paging data adapter so let's go and see the uh, code how how the code looks like so i have defined this movie paging source uh, which takes the api uh, uh, api service api service is just uh, interface uh, where i have defined the endpoint uh, of the network uh, from where i will be fetching the data and we have we uh, and extending the paging source providing it the uh, int is the key uh, of page number this is uh, in the in our case it's a page number uh and the object that will be retrieved from the uh, network and next we override a uh, function called load which returns the load result so inside this try catch block i have uh, uh, used uh, fetch the key which which key which which will be default key will be one and 
as soon as you get the network response you update this paging number uh, to the next page number and return that result and also if there is an exception you can return a load result dot error throwing it in an exception you can uh, show appropriate message based on the exception exception you got so uh, this is the first uh, layer uh, that is repository layer uh, where we are defining the paging source here you can use remote mediator also if you want to uh, first fetch the data from the network and then cache it into the uh, cache it into the i'm sorry and if you want to cache it into the uh, database right next is uh, view model layer where we define the paging config uh, let's go to the view model and if you see here here is the pager i have defined uh, passing it the page config in page config i have just given a uh, size of the page it will be a 20 uh, 20 movies per request so i will be getting a 20 movies from the network every time and it will be a uh, shown uh, in the ui and passing it the movie paging source uh, with with the movie api service and this this is a flow which i will be converting it into a live data in the view model so uh, how to use this pager uh, paging config uh, as i talk about this how i, I was using a map so repository dot page pager dot cached in i want to cache this data into in this view model scope and this view model scope is tied to the fragment view life cycle owner and take calling it as as a live data so whenever this live data is changed uh, i convert into the ui model and this returns me a new live data which i will be rendering it into the ui so if you see i am uh, observing here at any time this data is changed i will i, I will submit that new data to the uh, adapter and let's see how to define this paging adapter so if if we go to the paging adapter which is the ui layer uh, where we define the paging adapter uh, this is same as the normal recycler view adapter that you extend uh, the only difference here is uh, you need to set this adapter from the coroutine scope because the in, or everything will be do, uh, will be done in the background uh, so you need to uh, submit the data in the coroutine scope. So uh, just a difference here is the you provide a entity which will be displayed on the, which will be an item entity and the view view holder class overriding the on bind view holder and on create view, view holder. I am taking benefit of view, view binding here. Let's see the view binding code also how I have used. So uh, to enable data binding, uh, first thing you need to uh, do in app build.gradle app level file is to enable data binding. This is how you enable the data binding. And to convert it into data binding, the first uh, root layout is gonna be a layout. And inside that you define a data variable which is just a movie entity and this movie entity has id movie name and the poster image path and the vote count and rating so uh, if you want to uh, show it uh, render a text on the ui you you just add at the rate and the uh, parenthesis and passing it the movie dot movie now that's it you don't need to do uh, a find vy id and then referencing a view and then you are setting a text on that data binding helps you in removing that code and putting it into the xml for loading image i'm using a coil uh, library here and i have defined one data binding adapter if you see here uh, i have defined data binding adapter and i'm checking that 
whether the url is null and that using this extension function this is an extension function provided by the coil library and you can use that to load the url so any time the uh, this data is uh, movie entity is changed this will again be called and your a uh, new updated poster or movie name or anything you are using for data mining will be re-rendered so this is how you can enable data mining uh, getting back to the slides so we have uh, sqlite on top of that we have room and now we have added the paging library uh, which will be used to fetch the data in chunks of data uh, in chunks of uh, data and it will be displaying it on the on the ui uh, one more thing is you can use uh, adapter for uh, if you want to show a loading progress bar at the bottom of the recycler view you can use something called as with load state footer and there is couple of more method like with load state header and there is one more method which is load state header and footer so here you need to define a separate adapter for that and i have defined one separate adapter by extending the load state adapter so uh, as soon as the you reaches the end of the list you will you will see the progress bar uh, till the time the net network response has not uh, received and as soon as your data is received you will be uh, this loading bar loading progress bar will be removed and you will get all the uh, data that are fetched from the network so this helps you a paging library in taking all your code which you need to write on your own to get the data uh, from the network uh, small small data like in mainly in uh, chat section if you have a chat section in your app you may want to get the data in uh, data in small small size so uh, paging library is a perfect fit for that you can use this paging library to get the data uh, from the network so we have seen uh, how to add the life cycle and view uh, live data view model and room together so as we can see view i have talked about view model and live data are all life cycle aware this helps you in avoiding and leaking the mem uh, memory and updating data from inactive ui element as i said if your activity is not in an appropriate state your data will not be exposed to the ui as soon as it comes you, your activity is on uh, resume state uh, you will be getting a last emitted data from the live data second is the room accessed by a view model and live data of, uh, object that i have shown you in the code uh, this helps you in separating your data from ui next we have i have shown you room using the coroutine uh, because you cannot uh, perform a query on the main thread so uh, for that you can use coroutines and uh, mr uh, mario has my friend mario has uh, talked about coroutine how to use coroutines uh, in kotlin next is architecture component which is rx java uh, rx java friendly uh, although this talk does not cover rx java but uh, you can use rx java with live data view model room it has uh, you have the support for using rx java next is the navigation architecture component uh, let me give you an example uh, activities are com components on its own so suppose you have an two activities and you want to share data between them a note i am talking about the sharing the data between them not passing data from one activity component to the another activity component so there is a difference so is there any scope to 
share a data between two activity component because this two activity component has their own life cycle and you don't know when this uh, one of the component can get destroyed and the other component uh, may get destroyed so there is an application scope which runs on top of all the component in the android framework so you can use but that's not anyone will recommend you to use because it it will expose your uh, data sharing data to all the component like services broadcast receiver uh, active another activity which you don't want so what what we really want a kind of shared scope uh, that's just within a couple of component like couple of component here could be a between one activity only you want a scope to share it to uh, share a data between two destinations so we so what can we do in this case is uh, we can have a multiple uh, destinations within an activity scope and we can have a shared view model that both destination can talk to so one destination can put the data in and the other destination can listen for the changes so uh, let me share one of the use cases that i came across uh, in my application was uh, you have an otp uh, validation functionality in your application so uh, i have one destination where i am taking the number from the user and the other destination i have it as a verifying the otp they, they, these are two different screens so i want a scope where i am sharing the data between the these two component these two destination so and this destination are nothing but a fragment um, which which navigation component provides uh, and and these destinations uh, will see how you can use it in your uh, uh, app so to create a navi uh, to know about navigation component uh, android studio provide you a template uh, by using basing activity you you will get a two fragment by default and the navigation view integrated in that so let me talk about the navigation component uh, three important uh, characteristics of uh, navigation component the first one is the navigation graph and this is a new xml resource file uh, which will which will contain all navigation related information in one central central centralized location so uh, what kind of information does this navigation graph holds well this include information about destinations possible paths that user can take from current destination to final destination also holds information about uh, argument that you are passing from one destination to another uh, while navigating and some of the launch launch uh, launch pad uh, launch mode in the application so uh, if you see this arrow are the path from uh, from this screen you can navigate to this screen and from this screen you can navigate to this screen uh, and this all are destination uh, screen uh, destination shown on this screen, uh, slides next uh, we have important thing is the nav host fragment so a nav host fragment is an empty container uh, which is the subclub uh, which you provide it a name as a nav host fragment and which is embedded inside the activity uh, layout which serves as a placeholder placeholder for the destination so what i mean here is this is just going to be a window where all the fragment destination are going to swap in and out uh, which are included in the navigation graph and nevost is the implementation of nevost fragment the third uh, and if you see here code uh, we have uh, uh, provided the name as the nav host fragment uh, and the nav graph which is the xml file which i just uh, talked about uh, in the previous slides now the next most important thing is the nav controller 
this is nothing but an object that manages app navigation within a nav host so if you want to navigate from one destination to another destination you can call this find nav controller and navigate to this action id which is from one fragment to another fragment this this let me show you the code how how it looks and how you can use so to create a navigate uh, to create a project with navigation you can uh, go to new project and select a basic activity which will give you a two fragment and one main activity as a host activity for all those destination so let me first go to the nav graph how does that nav graph look like this is another resource directory inside that we define a nav graph and this is how the nav graph look like so i have given a path that from this fragment i can either move to another fragment and i can move to itself as well in my case it, it's not it's not going to be always the fragment is always going to be uh, called it, it's itself and the another thing is how to add a argument so here uh, you can add a argument so how that how does that look uh, in xml file so here is the argument i provided the default type and this is just an enum so oh sorry this is just an enum and these are the action that uh, that when you draw a path this id will be generated by by itself you don't need to do anything and the destination as a fragment id so this is just a fragment which will be pointing to a fragment layout and uh, fragment which will be called when uh, this first fragment will be uh, swapped uh, out and the another fragment will be uh, getting uh, swapped in uh, in 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 the uh, nevost fragment so where is the nevost fragment it is in main activity where i have define a fragment and inside that fragment i have pointed that this this is the nav graph where i have defined all the destinations uh, argument that i will be passing as well as the behavior of the launch mode so it can be uh it it you can define the launch mode so that uh, it should not go to the back stack uh, the back stack will be handled by itself you don't need to worry about uh, the back stack handling or in this navigation component next is uh, let's see how i am navigating from one fragment to uh, another fragment so here is the uh, interesting thing so i have uh, used bottom navigation view in my case uh, you can set up this uh, navigation component with uh, nav navigation view uh, bottom navigation view or the top app bar so uh, this is the action id uh, this is the menu i have defined this is the menu uh, where i have defined two menu item and based on that i am moving from i am calling that find nav controller and navigating to this action so uh, this is from the save arg uh, plugin that i am using so what are the benefits of save arg uh, uh, plugin is that it helps you in passing data from one destination to another so this is null safety it provide a null safety while passing the data and it helps you in passing the default value for your argument as well so some of the benefit of uh, this navigation component uh, is first first thing is the uh, safe arc plugin that i was talking about this provides the type safety when navigating and passing data between the destination the second important thing when using navigation component is the handling fragment transactions uh this also provide animations and transitions so uh 
let's say if you want to uh, provide a shared animation between the recycler view and the next screen so uh, it helps you in passing the extra information while uh, you are navigating from one destination to another destination and in that extras you can refer your view id and the transition name so that you, you can see an animation from one destination to another destination third important thing is the hand handling up and back action correctly by default so you don't need to show a back button on the uh, on any destination this will be handled by navigation component by itself the fourth important is the support of navigation ui pattern out of the box without much effort as i was talking about you can use bottom navigation or the uh, navigation view or the navigation drawer this this supports everything in the navigation component so this is how i was talking about the your uh, na navigation graph xml looks like i have shown you in the code next thing is uh, i'll talk about the jetpack compose so jetpack compose is a declarative ui which comes under the android modern toolkit for building your native ui uh, it simplifies and accelerate ui development for on android and quickly bring your app to life with less code powerful tool provide power tool tool and initiative kotlin support so jetpack compose is fully written in kotlin so it's very important to start migrate migrating or learning kotlin because this is going to be a next future for android development so uh, jetpack compose has learned from other frameworks why this jetpack compo component come and from where it has been um, uh, taken from so if you see another uh, uh, platform like react or uh, vue js or flutter uh, this uses a declarative ui pattern so uh, you so you don't need to uh, reference a view like in initiative uh, in, in this uh, current android development you you see you define your uh, layout in the separate file and uh, in the other uh, in the component you mutate it and you uh, find that view and update the view with the data you you are getting from the network so in jetpack compose everything is composable function i'll show you the how, how this composition composable function looks like i have created one demo app so uh, what is the difference uh, in the uh, this framework is a mobile framework such as jquery and android ios this uses the imperative style of uh, ui programming to build the user interface where you required to assign a unique selector to each ui component referencing it into the code so declarative ui on the other hand encourages you to construct the ui tree by building the ui blueprint first instead where each ui component is immutable and simply react to the changes of its binding data model and re-rendered accordingly so if any data is changing a uh, whole ui tree is not needed to be re-rendered only the part of the data model which has changed has to be re-render its ui and here i i, I said about the state uh, binding data model so state is an application uh, is any in application is any value that can change over a time and your view view is immutable this is not going to be changed only it will react to the changes of the data model also jetpack support material design theming and component from beginning uh, and also it supports animation allowing developers to focus on creating beautiful user interface then 
let's see the code how uh, you can start with uh, jetpack compose currently jetpack co compose in a, is in um, uh, alpha soon it's going to be uh, in a final release so i have created one app uh, here let me run an emulator uh, with jetpack compose so if you see here everything is a composable function so uh, even if you see this set content method this is also a uh, extension function which is taking taking a composable uh, function as a body content part so counter app is a composable function uh, i am using one scaffold ui which is also a composable function which is used to define a draw uh, uh, navigation drawer uh, bottom navigation view and uh, even floating button uh, for the uh, ui for the uh, as you use normal nav bottom navigation view in the normal application in jetpack compose you need to define it in inside this scaffold so what happens when i click here the count is getting incremented so how this is happening uh, yeah, under the hood is i have written this simple floating action button and there is as i spoke about the mutable state I, as I spoke about the this state, this state when changes uh, any U, uh, UI component that is dependent on this state is gonna be re-rendered. So in this case, when I am clicking on the floating action button, I am incrementing the count, and this text view is uh, this text view is re-rendered again. So here, whole UI will not be re-rendered. Only the comp component which is dependent on this mutable state will be re-rendered and this is the benefit of uh, jetpack compose you don't need to use find view id you don't need to uh, write a separate xml file and then taking a reference from that and uh, uh, composing your ui so this is all about uh, uh, jetpack compose here uh, if you want to see a preview without running an emulator this is something preview annotation you can use on top of the composable function uh, note the composable uh, function with preview annotation cannot take a parameter so you need to be very carefully using preview annotation you can use uh, some of the uh, preview uh, field value like background color you can give let's, let's give some color so you need to build and refresh so you can also sorry there is an error So you can give any color. You can also specify the width, width and height, so that you you can check the responsiveness of the UI. So if you give seven hundred dot dp, so this will take. So you can you define the width in DP as well and the height in DP so that you can check how your UI is responding to in the preview view only. You cannot uh, this will be uh, only seen in the preview view. There is some build error. Yeah. A 
it's taking time. So this is how you can use Jetpack Compose in a, see this 700 width is, has been taken and how your UI is respond, responding uh, with the content. You can check, there are few more parameters, feel free, free to explore and how to create an Jetpack Compose uh, uh, application is you can go, to, uh, you need a Canary version uh, to use this without canary version of android studio you cannot uh, start jetpack compose development so go to new i am using currently canary version uh, for android studio 4.2 canary 8 so uh, you need to install this canary 8 version uh, and go to new project you can select empty compose activity and you can start your development Coming back to the slides. So as I talked about the preview annotation and it has a full interoperative operability with your existing Android code. You don't need to worry. You can start migrating slowly into the Jetpack compo component once it is in a final release version. Currently it is in alpha. So next let's talk about the new way of distributing your apps. Uh, it's not about the just APK anymore. We have now Android app bundle. So uh, why this Android app bundle came is many users have limited storage on their device. And when the app size is larger, storage matters a lot and there is a high probability that user can uninstall the app due to the its uh, size heavy size so android app bundle with a larger apk helps you in re reducing the size and if you, if the app size is being reduced it increases the chance of uh, user downloading that app so uh, that's why with the with, with the constraint like uh, storage is a, a first priority that uh, every application should have uh, should be uh, should have android device should have a storage so that application can install but there are devices which come up with a low memory space so we need to consider that as well so android app bundle helps you in reducing the app size uh, making it smaller, uh, office floating your code. So how this helps Android app bundle? Uh, Android app bundle achieve smaller installs by only downloading the config data needed for the particular device. If you see this, if you are installing through a normal APK, it will put all the uh, config files and the needed for the uh, whatever whatever is packed inside the apk everything will be downloaded but in android app bundle there, there is a if your device is not supporting camera and the camera feature has been added inside it that won't be downloaded so this lead blot, blotted apk that are too large for every device or configuration specific apks that has have to be managed by the developer so we we come up with an android app bundle with smaller size so this is another another way to visualize per configuration download so based on the required device uh, configuration the uh, app bundle is uh, downloading its data onto the device App Bundle also enables dynamic feature delivery where app modules can be delivered as needed per device through the same App Bundle format. So you don't need to uh, worry a lot about when you are implementing a dynamic feature module. App Bundle is a great choice for distributing your apps on the Play Store. So uh, currently apps in production are, are greater than 500,000 and 35% of the active installs are using uh, app bundle. 
and everyone is slowly moving towards the app bundle rather than the normal apk for uploading uh, your app on the play store so th uh, that's all for today's talk uh, let me quickly uh, once again go go through the all what we have discussed the first thing we uh, discussed here was the language uh, uh, by kotlin as i spoke about the jetpack compose also which is fully in kotlin so you need to start moving towards the kotlin for the for the future of modern android development next uh, we talk about the tools so in tools uh, we have motion editor uh, which um, my friend mario had discussed how motion editor helps you in uh, in doing animation of your ui third is the we talk about the apis in apis i covered the life cycle on aware component live data uh, view model how to use room with the uh, live data and view model how to use paging library uh, with uh, room and uh, how to use in, in the view model also we have discussed about the navigation component uh, how what are the benefit of navigation component and lastly we discussed about the distributions which which is the choice of developer now uh, de distributing their apps by not generating apk but using the android app bundle that's all from my side uh, thank you i hope you enjoyed and if you have any question feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question Thank you. Thanks, Rajneesh. Um, I think you covered it extensively and everything needs to sink in. So maybe that's why people are not asking questions. Um, so I'll, I will proceed and um, uh, save it on YouTube. Hopefully, please yeah. revise if you have any questions then. Do reach out to, Rajne to Rajneesh and Mario both on uh, our Slack channel and also through Instagram. Um, and have a great night. Thank you, both Rajneesh Thank and Mario. You, everyone. Thank you for joining all. Thank you all. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah, yeah good night.